In this video, we continue our journey along the Chicago Great Western Route from Chicago to Old Wine, Iowa, visiting all of the disused stations along the way. This time, we continue on the Iowa Heritage Trail through Dubuque County, Iowa, visiting the former station of Kidder, then on to Farley, and finally completing this leg of the tour at Dyersville. As always, we'll explore railroad artifacts of interest along the way. From Graff, the next station along the Chicago Great Western Line was Kidder, a little less than four miles to the southwest, following along the scenic Little Maquoketa River Valley, which continues to ascend westward out of the broader Mississippi River watershed until it passes into Hogan's Branch Creek. This leg of the journey, from here to Dyersville, is chock full of bridges and will pass over multiple instances that span the Little Maquoketa River, the first being a short distance southwest of Graff. We'll stop and explore those that appear to be original to the railroad.
arrive at a picnic area with an interpretive sign for the Kidder Station and stop just beyond a bridge that spans Hogan's Branch Creek. This structure is another fine example of a surviving Chicago Great Western Bridge. In spite of the presence of the interpretive sign just to the west of the creek, the Kidder siding and station were actually located several hundred feet to the west of the creek along the trackway. In fact, the station house stood about 100 feet southwest of Gun Club Road, about one mile north of the town of Epworth, and on the south side of the right-of-way. Kidder Station took its name from the local landowner, Zephaniah Kidder. The Kidder Station stop appeared on the CGW timetables from the railroad's earliest days in 1888. By the early 1890s, the rail yard consisted of a small station and stockyards, a few small sidings, as well as bunkhouses for section hands. The station house at this time was likely a small wood frame building. Like Bud and Graff, Kidder Station was primarily used by local farmers to ship dairy products, grain, and livestock to faraway markets. It saw only limited use for passenger service. Nonetheless, a new station house was built in 1916, this one being 16 feet by 40 feet in dimension, similar if not identical to the station house that stood at Graff. A single siding almost 400 feet in length also serviced the rail yard. As Chicago Great Western passenger service continued to decline, in 1948 the Kidder Depot was formally decommissioned and sold to a local farmer by the name of Bogey who presumably used it for storage or a shed. Curiously, census records and plat records put the Bogey Farm to the west-northwest along Hewitt Creek, very close to the iconic Field of Dreams. It's possible the Kidder Station Building may still survive on a farm close by this landmark. CGW timetables indicate that the Kidder stop went out of use in the 1950 timeframe. The small community of Kidder arose directly as a result of the building of the Chicago Great Western Railway and consisted of a handful of buildings tucked within the bluffs that line Hogan's Creek. Two water-powered grist mills operated along Hogan's Creek. The nearby community of Epworth, a short distance south, likewise arose as a result of the arrival of the Illinois Central Railroad more than 30 years prior in the mid-1850s. Zephaniah Kidder, and Anna Johnson Kidder, for whom the Kidder Station was named, were one of the original pioneer families of Epworth. Prior to the establishment of Epworth, an earlier small settlement established by Daniel Hogan gave name to the creek that still runs by Kidder Station. Epworth, named for the birthplace of English theologian John Wesley and platted in the mid-1850s, was already a thriving town when the Chicago Great Western announced its intentions to build a new railroad to the north of town in the late 1880s. At that time, Epworth already had a population north of 500. In fact, it had incorporated as a city by 1879. Here stood several stores, mills, churches, and schools, as well as a hotel and post office. Zephaniah Kidder owned a general store here, as well as owning much of the land to the north of town, and likely operated his grain mill along Hogan's Creek. As we have seen in many other places along the route, the upstart Chicago Great Western elected to avoid placing stations too close to its competitors, such as the Illinois Central, in hopes of drawing traffic away from their more established rivals. In the long run, this may have fixed the CGW's identity as being more of an agricultural freight hauler rather than as a passenger train, since in most cases, the town's center and residents stayed close by the original location, and instead, farmers and their freight became the primary users of the newly established depots outside of town. With the loss of the Chicago Great Western Railroad, the community of Kidder slowly faded from the maps and local memory. 
Epworth, however, has continued to grow. In addition to other local industries, a major Methodist seminary was established at Epworth in 1857. This eventually became a school. Later, a Roman Catholic seminary took root in the 1930s, becoming the Divine Word College, located at the southern border of town. Today, Epworth tops out at over 2,000 residents. The city has benefited from U.S. Route 20 on its southern border, as well as the continued operation of the railroad, once the Illinois Central, now the Chicago Central and Pacific Railroad, operating on a Canadian national road. The town is proud of its small town status and wears the motto of small town, big heart, with pride. From Kidder, Hogan's Branch Creek continues almost due west, and the CGW right-of-way follows this scenic path for more than four miles, until it reaches the northwest outskirts of Farley, where Hogan's Branch Creek dies out. Here, too, we'll pass over many bridges, some of which are original to Chicago Great Western days. We come upon a modest-sized CGW bridge with a span of about 70 feet.
About 500 feet east of Bogey Road, we find another bridge from the CGW days. This one appears to be of 1927 vintage. As we ascend out of the river valleys, the landscape now opens up with intervals of trees and fields. Today, we pass under Holy Cross Road in what was once a grade level crossing. Just beyond this crossing, about 100 feet west of Holy Cross Road, to the south of the trackway, stood the Chicago Great Western's Farley Station.
The town of Farley is about one mile south of this station and is another example of the Chicago Great Western attempting to lure freight and passenger traffic from the more established Illinois Central and Chicago, Milwaukee, and St. Paul railroads without the expense of the higher right-of-way costs that they'd incur by passing through the center of town. The station was opened during the earliest days of the railroad and appears on CGW schedules from 1888 onwards. Sometimes the station and community were referred to as North Farley, or as Arquit, in deference to the stone quarry owned by Benjamin Arquit, which stood just a short distance east of the station. In fact, one of the primary uses of this station was for shipping quarried stone to market, shipping hundreds of carloads of limestone to Dubuque over the years, a special type of yellow-gray limestone. The first depot building burned down in 1892, and a new station building was built. It was a standard Chicago Great Western building for its time, a Victorian wood frame structure, 16 feet by 45 feet in dimension. Multiple sidings stood to the north of the trackway, each capable of holding 50 to 70 cars. The rail yard included a bunkhouse for section hands. Nearby, just to the north of the line, there also stood a U.S. post office, a hotel, and a warehouse. You can still see remnants of a building foundation just north of the former station, perhaps a long-gone warehouse. The Farley Rail Yard, like many on the line, could be a dangerous place, especially in the early years. During the evening of September 24, 1890, a brakeman, Frank Barker, was run over by a freight train in the rail yard while setting a switch. His body being badly mangled, he died a few hours later. In 1892, an eastbound freight train derailed near the station. But fortunately, there were no injuries. More than a decade later, in 1904, immigrant farm laborer Andrew Anderson was walking along the rails when he heard an approaching train. He stepped out of the way, but not entirely, his head being hit by the steam box of the passing train, killing him instantly. During the first three or four decades of operation, the Chicago Great Western Crossing at Holy Cross Road, just east of the station, was at grade level. However, in the latter part of the 1930s, the Iowa Highway Commission installed a viaduct at the Chicago Great Western Crossing, carrying the automobile traffic over the right-of-way. That viaduct was eventually filled in after the CGW stopped operations in the early 1970s. With passenger traffic fading in the 1930s and 1940s, the depot was finally retired in 1949 and was replaced with a one-half boxcar to be used primarily as a freight office. The station finally disappears from the Chicago Great Western timetables in the late 1950s. The Farley CGW station was located in Taylor Township of Dubuque County. Like Epworth to the east, Farley was established with the arrival of the Dubuque and Pacific Railroad in the mid-1850s, which later became the Illinois Central Railroad. It was so named for Jesse Preston Farley, former mayor of Dubuque and railroad magnate, who had strongly lobbied for the introduction of the railroads in the region. The rumor of the railroad brought settlers as well as a post office to Farley. By the mid-1870s, Farley had added another railroad, the Dubuque Southwestern, which later became the Chicago, Milwaukee, and St. Paul Railroad, heading southwest to Worthington. At that time, the growing town included five stores, four churches, three hotels, lumber yards, grain elevators, a cheese factory, and a creamery, with one commentator highlighting that the town is well laid out the streets all running at right angles. Indeed, there can be no higher praise. With a population topping 500, Farley incorporated as a town in 1879. Since that time, like Epworth to the east, Farley has been growing slowly but steadily, with the population today exceeding 1,700 residents.
It too has benefited from the proximity to U.S. Highway 20, as well as the continued operation of the Chicago Central and Pacific Railroad. Farley's town motto is a bit more ambitious, heart of the Corn Belt. And from what we can see, it's still beating. Next along the Chicago Great Western Line, heading west out of Farley, is Dyersville, a full stop lying six and a half miles west-northwest along the right-of-way. For this segment, we leave river valleys and bridges behind. The topography is much more open here, riding through rolling cornfields, punctuated by the occasional cluster of trees, with Interstate Highway 20 and the former Illinois Central Railroad within sight to the south on our left. These parallel railroad tracks sometimes gave rise to good-natured races between the Illinois Central and the Chicago Great Western trains. From a geological perspective, we have left behind the bluffs and towers of the driftless area and have entered into the Iwin Drift Zone, soil built up for millennia by the wind that dominates much of the Iowa terrain.
After traveling for five and a half miles, we reached the western end of the Iowa Heritage Trail, the eastern limits of Dyersville, where the gravel path ends and becomes Beltline Road, which today follows the old Chicago Great Western right of way. A wide sidewalk provides safe passage on the north side of the road. To the south, in parallel with the road, is the former Illinois Central Line, now the Chicago Central and Pacific Railroad. A huge lumberyard dominates the landscape to the north as we travel west. A nice community pavilion makes for a welcome rest stop for travelers along the Beltline. Fortunately, a meandering sidewalk continues on the north side of Beltline Road, allowing a safe ride for cyclists. As did the Chicago Great Western in the past, Beltline Road leads into the northern perimeter of Dyersville, with the former CGW station standing near the northeast corner of Beltline Road and 2nd Street. The Dyersville Station appears on the earliest Chicago Great Western timetables, serving as a full stop for most passenger and freight trains. According to early maps, the CGW Depot originally stood on the south side of the tracks, north of the Hewitt's Creek Mill Race, with two sidings to the north of the main line. Just a few hundred feet to the southeast stood the larger Illinois Central Station. By the early 1900s, the original depot appears to have been converted to a freight depot, with a new passenger depot built on the north side of the main tracks. This depot was of standard Chicago Great Western design, with a footprint of 22 feet by 55 feet in dimension. Multiple sidings filled the rail yard. In 1905, a well was drilled and a wooden water tower was constructed a few hundred feet northeast along Chestnut Avenue. To the south of the tracks stood a grain elevator and a warehouse, and to the south of them stood coal sheds. Stockyards were located to the east of the rail yard, also to the south of the tracks. One of the worst accidents that the Chicago Great Western ever experienced occurred here in Dyersville. On the evening of February 25, 1904, a freight train heading east and running behind schedule pulled into the Dyersville station at about 8.20 p.m. and waited for train orders and for a push engine to be added to the rear to assist with the ascending grade east towards Farley. Ten minutes later, just as the helper engine took its position, a second and larger freight train came down grade from the west at a high rate of speed. In the darkness, the approaching freight train was unaware of the train waiting at Dyersville. The crew of the helper engine, seeing the approaching freight train, jumped to safety just as the approaching train crashed into the helper engine, traveling nearly 60 miles per hour, according to witnesses. 
The push engine in turn slammed into the caboose of the waiting train, instantly killing multiple stockmen and a passenger who had been sitting in the caboose. The momentum of the speeding eastbound train carried it through the forward trains, destroying nearly 40 train cars in all. The engineer of the speeding freight train had jumped to safety, but the fireman was trapped between the engine and the tender, and was said to have died in terrible agony as the demolished engines and train cars caught fire and horribly burned those trapped inside. The Dyersville Fire Department fought the blaze for a few hours before finally being able to extinguish it. Killed were Fireman George W. Griswold, age 25, Stockman Albert R. Thomas, age 22, Stockman James W. Rhino, age 47, Stockman Thomas Cavanaugh, age 24, Stockman Herbert L. Fuchs, age 28, and passenger Michael C. Corrigan, age 31. Initially, blame for the wreck was assigned to the brakeman of the waiting train, noting that he had not left a warning signal for the approaching second train. Weeks later, however, a coroner's jury rendered the verdict that the conductor of the waiting train, Patrick W. Mahoney, was responsible. The train's brakeman had asked Mahoney what to do while they waited at Dyersville, and the conductor responded that he would take care of signaling the approaching train which he never did, resulting in the terrible tragedy. In 1910, the depot was remodeled, adding a waiting room for women and children to keep them separated from the smoke and coarse language of the men's waiting room. The baggage room was moved to the freight depot, and a 10-foot by 17-foot office was also added. Just four years later, the railroad installed a 100,000-gallon steel water tank in Dyersville, to replace the original wooden tank. Toilet facilities were added to the passenger depot in 1923. The station and rail yard continued to serve the Chicago Great Western and the Dyersville community for many years thereafter. However, the last passenger train departed Dyersville in 1967, and the decaying depot became something of an eyesore to the town, with a badly leaking roof, broken windows, and peeling paint. The structure was finally taken down, piece by piece, by two local farmers in September of 1972, who paid the railroad $111 for the building, or about $450 in 2024 money, recycling the wood and the copper wires for salvage. Several years later, in 1981, the former Chicago Great Western train tracks were removed with the iron rails being salvaged. The community of Dyersville goes a long way back in the history of Dubuque County. Settlers began trickling into western Dubuque County in the late 1830s, a log cabin here and there. This was at a time when a settler could come into an area, select a piece of unoccupied land, work the new farm, and improve it with little or no capital and then finally purchase it for a bargain price once the U.S. government made it available during its public land sales. This made it especially attractive for newly arriving immigrants. Western Dubuque County lands were offered for public sale in May of 1840. Joseph Hewitt, originally from Ohio, was among the first permanent settlers in the area, raising cattle on an isolated farm, literally in the middle of nowhere. Hewitt was followed by waves of immigrants in the 1840s, initially Bavarian Germans and Irish. They in turn were followed by a wave of English immigrants, including one James Dyer Jr. James Dyer emigrated from Banwell, England in 1847 at the age of 27, along with his wife Anne and their three children. Over the course of the subsequent six years, Dyer solely purchased almost 260 acres of public lands, and then more than 3,000 acres in Dubuque County jointly with others, which essentially covered much of Dyersville today. Many of these partnered purchases were Dyer making advance purchases for family, friends, and neighbors from England who had yet to arrive. He would sometimes plow their fields in the early spring so that their land would be ready for planting when they arrived. 
planning of the new town started in 1850 and was laid out in 1851, with James Dyer playing a prominent role. The town's location was settled upon as being the area least prone to flooding from the nearby Maquoketa River. In fact, the location of Dyersville was well selected. It was almost due west of Dubuque, only a few miles off the Dubuque to Delhi stagecoach road, a strategic pathway west. It was well watered too, with the confluence of Bear Creek and Hewitt Creek draining into the North Fork of the Maquoketa River, water for drinking, irrigation, and industry. James Dyer built a dam and a mill pond, and then a mill chase to direct the water to the water wheel, and then a mill in the early 1850s. He later built a hotel, the Clarendon, in 1857. A U.S. post office was established in 1854, and the population had by then grown to approximately 400 people. The upstart town was legally plotted in 1856, and by now was actively competing with the more established Rockville to the south. However, when the Dubuque and Pacific Railroad surveyors came through the area to lay out the railroad, which eventually became the Illinois Central, it was Dyersville that won out, mainly because the residents of Dyersville had more money to pony up than those in Rockville. The Dubuque and Pacific Railroad was completed in the spring of 1857 and was a great boon to the community. The population had swelled to approximately 800 people by this time. Many of the Irish immigrants that built the new railroad settled in the Dyersville area. James Dyer, whose energy and capital had driven much of the early development of the eponymous Dyersville, passed away in 1864 at the fairly young age of 44. His wife Anne lived another 24 years before passing away in 1888. Dyersville officially incorporated in 1873, with their first mayor being William Trick. The new taxing bodies public monies resulting in improved streets, sidewalks, sanitation, and policing. The population now hovered at about 1,000 residents, and within a few years, The town included four churches, two public schools, a dry goods store, a drug store, a hardware store, a shoe store, three hotels, numerous brick buildings, and a truss bridge spanning the Maquoketa River. Another short-lived railroad sprung up in Dyersville in the early 1910s, the Iowa Northern Railway, providing service between Dyersville and New Vienna, about five miles to the north. This unfortunate road lasted less than a year, rumored to have shut down as a result of the engine breaking down, never to be repaired, as the railroad owner was serving time in the penitentiary at that point. Bad luck indeed. Almost 150 years later, the city's population is at almost 4,500 people, the community seeing steady but continuous growth from its initial inception. Like Epworth and Farley, The local economy has benefited from the proximity to U.S. Highway 20, as well as the Chicago Great Western and the Illinois Central Railroads, the Chicago Central and Pacific Railroad, the Illinois Central's air, still being in operation today. Employers such as FarmTech, Modern Fold, Lumber Specialties, and Dyersville Diecast provide a solid base for the local economy. While the location for Kevin Costner's 1989 Field of Dreams film, situated just a few miles northeast of town, continues to be a significant tourist draw for the area. One wonders what Mr. Dyer, who plowed many of the fields in and around Dyersville 170 years ago, would think of the place that it has become. Our memories of the Iowa Heritage Trail Dubuque County, and Dyersville are all very positive, as they gave us a wonderful and intimate view of a significant portion of the Chicago Great Western Road, as well as the many communities that it strung together. We would especially like to thank Christy Detmeyer of the Dyersville Area Historical Society, a wonderful resource for area history and railroad history, the James Kennedy Public Library in Dyersville, and local railroad researcher Bob Williams. They all went above and beyond in helping with the production of this video. 
If you are enjoying these videos, please remember to like, subscribe, share, and comment. Or if you are so inclined, consider supporting us on Patreon. It helps our channel to grow and enables us to make more videos just like this. In our next video in this series, we'll leave the Iowa Heritage Trail behind and continue on once again by automobile, exploring Petersburg, El Moral, and Oneida. We hope to see you, in a manner of speaking, in our next video adventure.